Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Alaska County School Board meeting of Wednesday, August the 12th, 2020. This meeting is being held in the school board room, and this meeting is now called to order. The first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. Is there a move to adopt the agenda? So moved. We'll move by Ms. Burton, seconded by Ms. Josiah. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? All in aye. Opposed? And the motion passes 5 0. The first item on the agenda is a discussion of several different subjects, one of which is the Scientific Medical Advisory Council presentation by Paul Myers. So, um, I think just a minute, let me start. Doctors on the call, Dr. Lazardo or anyone else? 
don't hear any answers.
and so I'll talk to the 10,000 or so. Um, to the medical team, it said that we had one confirmed case in a classroom, but the entire class had been tested. Is that the plan? Or I was a little bit confused. I thought there were three, three confirmed, um, three or more confirmed cases in classroom schools. So if there's just one positive, we're going to test everyone, all the students, with the center parents and the teachers. relevant to this, but we have had some feedback that there has been difficulty here, the board members, um, and obviously with masks on it, that it's very difficult. We just need to make sure we speak up and have to turn this stuff as um, hard as we can make speak up in the microphone. Okay, we'll do our best to speak loudly. Um, I have some questions, um, Mr. Meyer, and um, there's a lot of discussion uh, locally about community transmission and what the positivity rate is currently. And um, I noticed here on your uh, uh, medical advisory um, uh, form that you say that it 
in general, find it. In general, data on successful school reopening comes from areas with minimal evidence of COVID transmission, community transmission, as reflected in the low percentages of positive test results. And then in a uh, second paragraph, you say, Alaska County staff are consistent with moderate ongoing transmission of the virus. So, my question is, what is this positivity rate and how is it um, calculated? Uh, is it over a period of two weeks? Is it a rolling uh, average over two weeks? And what is uh, considered uh, a safe uh, level of positivity for reopening. I know you can't advise us, but uh, just in general. <laughs> Thank you. So, the easy part of uh, the answer is the calculation. So, we have a cumulative positivity rate, and that is the number of positive tests, uh, non duplicated clients over the number of tests performed, and that could be uh, individuals testing more than one. And that's the beginning of the test. Um, in terms of what's most useful, uh, many point to a seven day rolling average, many point to a 14 day rolling average to give you a better picture of what's happening currently. But in terms of what the magic number is in terms of community transmission and how that relates to the opening and closing of various activities, including schools, including businesses, that is up for debate. And I'll refer to Dr. Morris and Dr. Rosario to add to that, but there is no perfect metric. And I'd be hard pressed to point to anything in the literature that says this is the number by which um, this drive should be open and closed. I, I, I saw that. There's no perfect answer, but thank you for, for whatever you can add to that. This is Dr. Morris. I would read the course what Paul said, and that, um, again, there's no perfect answer. And there are really very few data, if any data, that allow us to predict what's going to happen with higher levels of community-based transmission um, in this kind of setting. I think what we can say um, with a regional community conference is that, again, at the moment, with a moderate level of transmission in the community in Alaska County, which is where we are, um, it is that we will be getting students coming into school who are infected. And so consequently, um, what we have done is say, okay, we know the kids are becoming infected. How can we best try to mitigate that and minimize the risk of transmission within the school? Um, so we're not directly answering that question. What we're saying is at least these are the ways that you can try to minimize the risk that you will get broader transmission within the school setting. I think that's probably about the best we're going to be able to do at this point in time. And again, what's going to happen is over the next several weeks to months, uh, the school with a variety of different locations open up, we will begin to get a better feel for, you know, what numbers are critical. We simply don't have that right at the moment. I understand. All I would ask that is a focus on Alaska County. Um, one of our highest priorities has been the protection of the vulnerable. Certainly children can contract this disease, they can develop severe disease, but what the data is showing us is that those who are over the age of 65, particularly those who are medically fragile, are suffering the worst consequences of this disease. And that's why you see that we can take that into consideration on the front page, second bullet, third paragraph, where it says, when assigning teacher and staff responsibilities, consider risk factors and pre existing health conditions. That further underscores our approach in Alaska County, which we have been uh, relatively successful when compared to other counties in the state and, and really across the country in terms of our profession of the most vulnerable. So we have to take that into consideration to mitigate risk. Thank you, sir. Um, a couple of other questions. A um, number of people have written to us that they had their children in uh, daycare uh, situations all summer where the kids were closed, the 
without masks, touching each other, and there was no, um, there was no um, virus. So, is that correct? I mean, you say, I'm sure you've got your finger on the pulse of, of the community. Have there been outbreaks in uh, uh, pre-K uh, programs of this?
times of God's favor. Um, it, it has been emphasized, uh, I, I think, by more than one of the doctors, with the uh, importance of testing uh, as being a potential in contact crisis. Now, I, I, I think that you've given us a, a very clear path forward uh, with how we handle things. But we've also had the, the caution that there could be supply chain issues uh, down the road uh, as there are in Dijon and Wake. But if that continues, uh, where, where does that leave us with, with the ability to do the testing and, uh, that is so essential? To uh, the advice you're giving. So, I think so. Let me take a So, the plan that we put together right now with the capability at the University of Florida it is a bridge to the future. It's a bridge to point of care testing, and it's also an improvement over what we've been doing in this community with 24 to 40 hour turnaround time. Um, and I do have access to the Bureau of Public Health Labs where we're getting results back. And they're ramping up their capability of doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests at once. Um, but we really wanted to balance our approach uh, to try and keep a classroom open with that relatively quick turnaround time of 24 hours. If we have to stretch that to 48, um, we, that, that certainly is not ideal, and, but we can do that. And I have not had the fire issues with the Bureau of Public Health Labs, but I'll, I'll, I'll defer this to Dr. Morris to, to continue. Yeah, and also to the comment I wrote there, that the test that we use here at Emerging Avenue Institute is a, if you will, old-fashioned PCR test. Again, it's been highly sophisticated and it's the same test that CDC recommends. Uh, however, it is not a proprietary test put out by a specific company. And so consequently, we do not have the same degree of supply chain problems because the reagents we are buying are more general. Um, when you run into problems, and one of the issues, and again, I know I'm not getting technical here, but one of the issues we've had in this country in terms of testing is that the commercial companies may make test machines. They may not only use their reagents or their test machines. It's like when you buy a printer for a computer, you've got to buy the cartridges from the same guy who made the cartridges from the same guy who made the printer. And if those same cartridges aren't available, the printer is worthless. And so that's the problem we're running into is that most of the large commercial machines that are available um, require, or they need a point of care test, they require specific reagents that are only made by that company. And so if that company runs out of, you know, small supply chain problems, Thank you. 
decision in terms of how they want to inform their daily activities. So I know that's a, a long-winded answer, but, but that's a, it's a complicated question. Um, but we have been living with this for about eight months, and the deaths that we have had in Alaska County, uh, 11 of those have been in long-term care facilities. The, the remainder have been individuals who are, are much older and medically fragile. So, yes, we are going to have individuals who get ill, but the severity of the disease really the burden is on those who are most vulnerable. This is Dr. Nelson, and I just have a comment on that comment. I have a good colleague in South Africa, um, and in their school system, they're obviously dealing with a very similar um, set of challenge. And one of the two kind of really important things that they've done in terms of teacher uh, safety is that in the younger uh, ages, let's say, like three, um, kindergarten, uh, one or two, where it's very hard to match the kids.
no other uh, questions from the board. I, I want to thank you, Mr. Myers, and uh, Dr. Morris, and Dr. Rosario, and Dr. Nelson, and other um, physicians. Dr. McKeon. Dr. McKeon, I'm sorry if I leave anybody off. Um, but we appreciate all of your medical expertise, and thank you very, very much for being here. And um, this is Paul Myers. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to contribute. Um, we're all members of this community, and, and at the end of the day, we're all going to do this together. Um, we're just we're here to make a risk. We're here to help the school board. And um, if there's anything that we can do about you know, what we're doing right now, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We will not hesitate. We're counting on you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. The next item on the agenda um, is a review of the P.K. Young Laboratory School model, and Mrs. Clark is going to do that. There's been a lot of discussion in the community about this, and 
I hope that uh, everyone can hear. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair.
name is Alaska County Public Schools, and that they're coming to school, they're getting individual uh, uh, in person instruction from their teachers. Even on campus, they still do so. They're sitting in front of the computer for their entire school day. Uh, and so it's, it's not, it, it, the only difference is that they're not allowed to have the content. So the <laughs>
I will say that that is much more difficult to say. I mean, it's kind of all about our main goal is limiting the pipeline to oxygen. Because if we can get more pure digital, then obviously we have the opportunity then for our teachers with underlying health conditions to teach remotely and to not have to be in front of kids all the time. And so that's what the goal is. Can we pull out either, you know, put the brick and mortar kids all together, the digital kids all together? Thank you. 
adults that are working with the kids or are parents of the kids and then going out into the community. So um, obviously that's, that's an information we needed um, and feel like we had a clear, um, a clear message of that that was provided this morning, so that's how we want to further follow up with that email. Okay. So it sounds like you're, you're looking at the community positivity rate as well as the, what we have going on with this video. Right. Well, I think that, that I think that would be an important factor to consider. Now, if that medical advisor group says that's really not an important factor to consider, I'll have to defer to them. They're the experts on that. Um, but certainly, based on what was presented today, that warrants a further discussion uh, with them. Everybody's playing football. They're playing football. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm not an epidemiologist, so you know, I can put a number out there. But that doesn't, you know, I don't have the, the knowledge and skill set to stack that up right now. Um, that's something that we need that, that advice and that guidance from medical professionals, those in that field, to be able to provide that information. I, I only follow that person that because they're getting the health report. So I was hoping that if there was one that was on the show, I'll get sat down and talk about it that, you know, you have to get there. Because I believe this is going to be just like Jordan just said, we're going to open up in a few days and then we're going to get And you have to close back up. So I wonder if it's if that conversation has been had. So I'm just trying to, when you said, if we have to talk, I wonder if there was some other, some, some guy on it that you all have talked about. Right. So like I said, based on today's presentation, it would help all of us. Thank you, Mr. Hurst, Dr. Carlson. I'm going to go back to the last, because I've been talking about it for so many years. And I came up with this vision, was that the time for us to work. I want to have two nice conversations Right, and we should feel that with the principal group. If, if there is a way to do that, so the teacher just says, I really just cannot do this. Thank you. 
know that they have had those conversations with their teachers because there are some very strong benefits to all high clubs, and there are multiple districts that are doing all high clubs. That doesn't mean it's ideal for Lancaster County, and it doesn't mean it's ideal for every teacher, but I know that there are some teachers that are ready to go with high clubs and some that are not, but that lends itself to the um, potential or visual option that if, if they're really, really um, struggling with the high club process, that if we can get that technology to them at the school, um, then they can certainly do that visually. But again, like I said, the priority has to be the computers at home for the families that need the computers that are still in the future. That has to be a priority. And I'd like for you to address, uh, um, because I was listening to the specialists this morning about how many children will be in classrooms, but at the high school, it seems as if administration is saying that we will have higher numbers. That should not be. Right. So as they're working through their master schedules, like I just allocated some additional units to a school yesterday, as they're working through their schedules, they send those numbers to us, and then we can allocate some additional units to those schools to reduce those cost costs. So as they get that schedule, and so so where they have the need, like I've got to get these American history sections down or this video down, then we're providing the extra units to the schools to do that. I'd like to know which schools you are having to do that for. Okay. Well, so far I've only had to do it with First ones to the first ones to the well to ask for that first one. Well, we're not completely finished yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bailey. Um, let's, uh, you know, I'm worried a little bit about time, so let's go ahead then to the legal update. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Mr. Delaney. They get that finished, then obviously they'll be able to do that. But they don't want their, you don't want, you know, uh, teachers just need a tentative assignment in June. But when they come back for school planning, it was when they generally have their set schedule. Um, but obviously, when you have to schedule in a more um, non technology manner, where you're scheduling individually or one on one or pulling schedules differently, it takes more time. Thank you. 
So we want, and I don't think that that burden should be pushed off on um, our families that are possibly suffering. We, we got all these emails, a lot of emails from folks saying they're trying to get back to work. So we've got to make sure as an organization that we are providing the provisions that are needed for our staff to be working with us. You all already know I have an issue with, with teachers having to buy supplies and things like that for their classroom. I think we accepted that as a norm when it's not a norm. It should not be a norm. You know, no one's sending ASO out there. They have an issue going on and they got to go. Nobody sends them to buy their own book. The sheriff provides all that for them. So we should be providing everything that our staff and all need that ad- adequate provision. We should be doing that. It shouldn't be a um, burden to someone. Else. Thank you for getting clarified. Because um, I was just thinking the October count would, would take us down from there. We just need to comment to be Thank you. 
our, the scenario you're going through now is that if we open up and we have to close down because of the highest spread, because we already know we didn't have that in the summer, anyone got paid um, from March now. And so are you, the scenario you're expounding upon now is that for if we were, if we had to furlough employees because we were shut down or like a big, big proof like the shut down and the payers and the folks who don't have direct student contact to you. Is that what you're, is that what you're yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It would really be able to apply whether it's, um, you know, if you start originally um, on August 24th, 100% digital, that would be a further situation. Okay. I think if it's a more of a short-term, you know, a one-week shutdown, uh, we could probably find work for those folks to do. If you're a bus driver, you can go drive other routes. If you're a paraprofessional, maybe you're assisting a teacher with the online learning, learning in the transition, they can be happy. But the concern is when it's a more long extended, like if it was another, you know, three, four weeks, you know, at that point, um, we're kind of subject to that law because there's not enough work for those folks. So, in, um, in, there's been no communication. Um, has there been any communication from DOE or the governor, whoever, that if you have to furlough, that employees will be paid because there is a shut down, like any wild case or something like that? We had a huge up outbreak when folks came back to come.
by those who still work in the Florida Department of Education. Yeah,
they are, I know you see the same email that I could see, that they are not comfortable, they've not had enough time, um, and when I called our professional development on yesterday, I found out that certainly there will be other coaches and there will be other um, videos, but teachers need time to do this training and planning. And so when you plan four days of training this week, even if we uh, extend the opening time, they need to have that time for planning and training um, extended. No one is going to be able to get tenure in four days. That's obvious. And, and not only from our staff, but also from the University of Florida and Santa Fe College where people are using those platforms. Let's be sensible. If we want instruction to be the best and the quality that we're saying we're going to give our students, brick and mortar, e as well as digital, then teachers need to have more time. Four days was not enough. We thought that we had done a miraculous job in adding that a couple of weeks ago but it has not worked, and it's not worked. And as a former teacher, like all of us are on this board, we know that they need more time. So let's give them that, and that would be my um, opposition to starting on the 31st with absolutely nothing else in between before pre-planning. Pre-planning is not a week for training of this school. We need to have more time. I'm glad to hear Dr. Paulson ask for more time, but we need to have a measure for the teachers to have that extra training. Before the teacher home, I don't know if you're trying to hear you. I couldn't hear you. Sure. That's what you're saying. You're saying that I have to start the training. Sure, that would be one of the things. I can't hear you. I'm wondering, what do you think about my teacher? Uh, what we're addressing is Dr. Paulson's amendment to move the 
can't see. I don't even know how many beginning teachers we have. So we need to think about them as well as our senior teachers who have a lack of technology. I heard the superintendent say earlier that there were teachers who were excited about the training. I know if it was put in front of me, I would not be able to handle it in four days. That's why I'm asking. And I don't see us putting a dollar on that. Um, that we need to have this time on our instructional staff and our ESP if they are involved in this training.
in a place where it's low in the quantum inception rate and, and epsilon testing and tracing are available, the planning would probably be shaky. So that, in a place like that, the planning works fine. Electroquantum is not a place like that, and we're in a global pandemic hot spot. I'll ask you, is it safe for you to consider here in that setting? Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very much, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Thank you for taking care of 
are some of the pitfalls for me in in-person option for our students and our children to be successful. Um, like April, I have uh, daughters who just do not do well on line. They don't learn digitally. Um, they really need that in-person instruction. Um, so that's really, I think, all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for approving the mask mandate. I believe it's absolutely we need to keep our teachers and our children safe. Um, I think that we have the data behind it that shows that masks can greatly reduce the transmission. Um, and that was the social distancing measures that you guys are working on. I think will help make this a successful solution for both our teachers and our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jen. Thank you so much for having us in person. Uh, my name is Rosie McEwen. I'm a third year parent teacher at River Valley Rural Public Schools. Uh, I would like to make some presentations.
I'll make them out of this better. Will it be a feedback if I'm too close? And you can ask since your mask off. Oh, oh, thank you. Bless you. We've been out in the heat for a while. First of all, thank you for your work, along with all the hard work of our educators and staff to provide multiple options for our Alachua County family. Could you give your name, please, and Tanya Cooper, a parent of a student at Meadowbrook Elementary? Virtual options are great for families who do not feel comfortable sending their children back to school. I am grateful they are being given that choice. For those of us that are confident that brick and mortar schools are the best options for our children, the only correct course of action for you to take is to stick with the vote that you made today for brick and mortar schools to open, to reopen before the end of August as scheduled, enabling us also to make that choice.
Teachers have a stop wanting to protect our children. Teachers just don't understand the implications of this risk and can't go along quiet. Teachers do understand, right? Examples of how you are setting us up to fail at our jobs. The main job is to teach and keep kids safe. Accepting more than 10 kids in a classroom is not safe. There are more than 10 kids in each of my classes, and there will be. Having an outdated, ineffective, and sometimes completely broken HVAC system is not safe. Didn't have working AC for four or five months last year. It was 84 degrees at 8.30 in the morning. I'm not allowed to open doors, and I don't have windows, and I wouldn't be able to open them anyway. Lack of access to effective frontline PPE and 95 masks for everyone is not safe. These aren't available for non-medical personnel. It's a unique company we can put together from people, safety on their resources. Not having access to adequate sanitation is not safe. There is zero evidence that we're prepared in any way, shape, or form for a pandemic level situation. There are basic foundational precautions to ensure safety and they're not being provided or followed. Teachers know how schools run and where corners are cut. We feel every little pinch. We are not living a false illusion that things have been appropriately retrofitted or designed for greater safety. So we know we are being sent into a battlefield against a deadly enemy. We are equipped with a toilet paper roll sword and paper plate shield for protection. We are asking us to give our lives so you can have your funding. This is painful. It's not just about the health care safety, our mutual safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more person, Mana. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is not my first time. Hoping that uh, things can can change for the better in the future. My name is Carolyn Weber. I'm the parent of two school-age children. I'm here today to represent all of the teachers, uh, citizens, parents who are unable to be here because they're either quarantining <clears throat> or at school. First, I would like to say thank you to the board members, specifically Tina Sturgeon and Dr. McNeely, for their continued support for a safe reopening plan. We have been and are continuing to advocate for safe reopening. We, will, we have still not seen a plan that we feel will keep teachers, staff, and children safe. And you all know that. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk much more about that. What I would like to talk about today is the board and the district conduct. First, I'd like to say every meeting that we've had this summer has been at 6 p.m. There have been hundreds of emails, call-ins, and people sitting in the boardroom. During that time, we've politely asked, begged, cried, and sometimes screamed for a robust and safe reopening plan. There are people with PhDs, scientists, teachers, and other community members submitting well-thought-out and detailed plans to help the district. Very early in this process, Dr. McNeely asked the superintendent to put together a reopening committee. It is incredibly frustrating that instead of doing that, embracing the community's efforts and getting input from those who are frontline workers, you all have chosen to go another route. Instead of accepting our input, you have fought us every step of the way. There's a concept in business called employee engagement. Companies who strive for engagement can actually pay their employees less than their competitors and still be more successful. Because companies know that they are only going to be successful if they can recruit and re retain talented people. So how do you get engagement? Easy. You listen to the ideas and make people feel like they are part of something bigger. Make them feel like they have a voice in decisions. Clearly, that is not happening here. For too long, the board and district seem to have been able to do whatever they want without much engagement from the community or, frankly, your employees. We feel that that time is over. We're organizing people to continue to fight for equity and safety, and we will keep going until the children in this community are treated equally and you stop ignoring large groups of engaged citizens. We will continue to demand a seat at the table, and if you won't give it to us, we will find people who will. The tide is turning, the power structures are changing, and we're not going to stop until we have a district and a board that represents all students in Alachua County. It's not too late to get on this train, but we will not continue to tolerate the failure of this district to provide an equitable and safe place to work and learn. Um, the one
one thing that I would like to just say to all of you is we have, yeah, give me, give me one more second to close. We are all here. We are people engaged. We are begging you to engage with us. That is all we are asking for. This is a lesson, I think, in that direction. It's not going to stop here, though. We want an equitable school system for our children. So please, I'm begging you to keep the people who are engaged engaged and reach out for help when necessary. Thank you all. Thank you, Clever. And we are uh, at a point where we can discuss the uh, option as a board as to uh, whether to uh, pass the recommended action. Um, I ask people to give everyone, and that is every board member, a chance to speak and to question staff if needed uh, to help him or her reach that decision. So um, I am now opening the floor to whomever would like to speak or raise a, a, a comment or objection.
Do we listen to the ones that we hear on television or the main person um, or the, um, who, Anthony Fauci, I guess is his name? Everybody has different influence and different opinions. So I, I accept what the families are saying who really need to have the brick and mortar. I understand their dilemma, and I understand why they want to have it. But when I look at the full picture of us in Florida being the epic center for this virus, and what will possibly spread wide, that's the word, spread um, in a lot of counties when we have our wonderful students coming back to UF and to Santa Fe. I've spoken about this, and I know that all of us are concerned about any spread and the mitigation that would have to take place, but I don't think we have come to the enough of what that could be. And when I look at, and I brought you all something this morning, if you'll pass that to the Maya. Um, school districts reopening plans, a snapshot. I thought that was important for us to take a look at, especially we have, I think, three counties in our state who are going brick and mortar, Pinellas and Lee, and it was one more, but I don't remember. Um, oh, Pope, thank you, um, Superintendent Clark. But when I look at and listen to the experts talk about um, the danger of our children, and when I read that there are nearly 100,000 children who have come down with coronavirus in the last two weeks of July. I have a problem with that. We are all parents. Every last one of us sitting on this diet today are parents. So I have to put myself in the place of what would I do for my children, just like the parents are putting themselves in the place of brick and mortar. I wish there was a way to satisfy everyone, but I'm here to tell you, colleagues, I cannot, for the life of me, um, start with our teachers, our ESPs, all of our workers. We talk a lot about our bus drivers, but our, our people who work in food service, our cleaners, our electricians, I can go on and on. Everyone will be impacted in some manner. When I saw the list that Mr. Purvis sent us just yesterday, with all of the persons who have tested positive. And even though the superintendent shared with me this morning, many of those are employees who were 10 months and not, had not worked in, during the summertime with us. The fact of the matter is that they are our employees and that they are stricken with positive cases. I'm just wondering, what is going to happen by the fifth day that we are in school? Will we still be talking about the $30 million that we are in jeopardy of losing if we don't open five days a week? What if one of our family members are impacted in some kind of way? Would we still feel the same way about the $30 million that we are jeopardizing if we do not open up as the governor and the commissioner of education want. I have spoken already about the Canvas training, and I still hold to that. I don't need to say anything more about the hybrid or the high flex because you already know. But my thing is, how many of my coworkers must die because of negotiation. Life is not negotiable. Can we live with this? And I'm sure all of us would probably say no, because our negotiations are not strong enough. We have
have not had certain people, as one of our speakers said this morning, capable and welcome to sit at the table. The children are so important. We are committed to the success of every student. We live by that statement. And so we have to know whether we are doing the right thing. I cannot determine that by what I heard from the experts this morning. I was, I was hoping that we would get guaranteed specific things that would make me want to go totally with brick and mortar. I did not hear that today. So I have to defend the lives of our children, of our instructional staff, and all of the people who work under our contract. I want to know, how will you determine and define contract? Maybe that came from our listing of, of what the experts said. But what are we specifically going to do in this district? I've not heard that. I love everyone in this community, and I want to be a team player. But it is, to me, just not safe to open right now based on the data that we have been given. I, 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 I cannot see for the life of me. I have tons of emails that I downloaded like you have. Um, and I started highlighting many of the things that people are saying to us, not just our staff in a lot of county, but our citizens as well, and people who don't even work in the Alaska County School System. Everybody is asking, please slow up. Now that we have, and with the 31st being our start date, that's the start. But what will happen to this board when we come up with all of the positive cases that we will probably be in evidence? I don't know. I stand with I stand with you, my colleagues, but I differ in your philosophy. And I cannot for the life of me. I know there are some people on this board. Um, two in particular who really know the numbers and the impact of um, money. But when we think about what does this mean, does it mean that we lose the 30 million, but yet we save some people? That's where I think. And I'm not going to read anymore because I'm looking at the time on the wall, and I know that the chair wants to move this meeting, but when we get ready to have the vote, and you will ask for discussion at that time, I may add something else. I'm Chairman Roy. Likely to happen. 
to make medical suggestions to parents. For example, Kathy Bernsey considered medicating their children for possible ADHD issues in the classroom. The reason for this is persistent. Following the teacher, she is our physician. And I am not qualified to make recommendations of something that is ultimately a private medical decision between families and the doctor. And in conclusion, my suggestion to you is to continue with the reopening plan on which you have already voted. As it is written, and only shut down brick and mortar schools for one reason when medical professionals deem it unsafe to remain open. I am not qualified to suggest changing that. And I think that's powerful that it comes from a teacher. Um, and and I, I, you know, I think it, it, it's all very difficult uh, for parents. It's all very difficult for employees. You know, I have um, family that, that works for public. I, uh, I have, you know, I, I, I understand that, that it's difficult, but uh, my son is an HR in public, and, and they work very hard with, uh, to keep their employees as safe as they can and to treat them well and under these circumstances. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of I love the amended motion. I, I like the extra week that Dr. Paulson has suggested. I can't believe that that gives us time to get everything as close to right as we can get it. And yes, uh, I'm going to acknowledge that day one, we're probably going to have a case. Uh, that, and guess what? That case didn't start in school. It started somewhere else. But we have to follow the procedures. Uh, as, as long as testing is readily available, as long as uh, uh, contact tracing is followed, we have a chance to do this right. Now, if that isn't available, if that doesn't happen, uh, if, or God forbid the supply chain runs out, then we're in a whole other situation. But right now, I think we're offering a choice. We're offering a, a, a choice that most every district in the state is offering. And um, as difficult as that, as that is, uh, it does nothing is 100% right and wrong here. Um, I would like to see us uh, vote for the amendment.
um, that makes me pause. So we say if we open brick and mortar, can we do it safely? That's still my question. Um, if the teacher goes out because we were told by medical staff that there is minimal impact to students, it seems, based on the evidence that they have now, but we do know that children can be spreaders, um, young children, and as the students age, they can be spreaders. And then if I teach in staff that those who have an older or advanced age or who may have had underlying health conditions, if they can practice deadly disease, it could be deadly to um, my teaching staff. And I don't want to have to live with the fact of um, I voted based financial, based solely on financial reasons to open. And so uh, we have to think also that if a number of teachers are out sick with COVID-19, we would have um, substitute teachers in place. And the likelihood of those substitute teachers being more um, effectively trained or trained up at the same level as the teacher who is out sick is, is, is not likely. It, there's a very, very low probability that we will have a substitute in front of those students for 14 days at a minimum, uh, 10, 10 school days, and it could be longer if the teacher has an adverse relation, um, reaction to the state of Canada. And we know um, there were two. Up in Tallahassee, in our state, you know, we can talk about other things that have happened, but um, two staff members in one school that they did not do well, they, they passed from that. Um, so I, I, I stand by my decision to say that um, I don't think we're ready for opening brick and mortar. I stand with our instructional staff um, against the, the emergency order that's been put out. Because our teaching staff, they need us to stand in camaraderie with them and to kind of call the bluff of those in Tallahassee because they can't spread. The risk to them is very, very, very high that if they say we're just not going to show up. And it's not to say that, um, and, and I respect the folks who work at Publix and they're doing all of these things and they're going out because their, their employer is open. But we, we have to, to not just put in a predicament just to say we want to go on with our life. We're really trying to find a, a manner in where we can proceed um, where it's safe for everyone that's involved and that we don't just meet the needs of one demographic at the expense of another. And I'll also add that I think it's very um, odd now that um, just recently today that the governor signed an executive order that we can continue to meet virtually, but we're sitting here voting whether or not we will send people back to work. So if, if it's not safe for us to have public meetings and have full public input in an environment, but we're going to send, and this is a more controlled environment than a school setting, a public meeting is, it doesn't have near the people that a school setting has. So we can continue to meet virtually, but we're voting to send the 15,000 15, students back, 10,000 students back to brick and mortar. That's a whole lot more than what we have at a typical board meeting. So I'm just, I'm, I'm really disappointed in how things are working out. We want everything to go. And we would say we can't afford to pay the $2.1 million and have one additional week of training. So we have not equipped our, our teaching staff, our instructional staff, with, in a way, even the janitors. I two janitors called and said that the training that they got last week was, 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 was insufficient. One extra, the, it was insufficient. So I, 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 I I'm for reopening school if it's safe, but I don't feel it's safe right now. I, don't, I really don't feel it's safe right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Um, does anybody else want to speak? Mr. Uh, I'm if we can have the rest of the members speak, then we'll come back to you. Okay. Dr. Paulson, did you want to say anything? So we could provide training modules for teachers if they chose to access them. Thank you.
everyone, when you're one of both sides, right, you're the winner. You're the same as I Some of you here in here, one more time, the secret is still so clear. It's just that we don't have each one seen why I'm hating the game. And we stay here. And I stand with those people. Oh, I think I am. I don't know. One of us answered hundreds of emails. There's no question on that. We all know what we know. Uh, I'm a little uh, upset that people are implying that we haven't listened to the public because there wasn't a committee or we didn't have a district advisory committee. Um, we had hundreds of uh, personal comments. Board meetings, we had hundreds of emails, we had phone calls, we had personal conversations. Uh, we heard and listened to people uh, very well. Now, we gave people, parents, to a choice. They could either have a digital option, one of either the digital academy or e school or brick and mortar. Almost half the parents chose brick and mortar, and the other half, or a little more than half, chose either e-school or a digital academy. When we voted for the digital academy, it included, and there were four of us who voted for the digital academy, it included brick and mortar. All of us are worried about safety. We are. And uh, Mr. Myers, Uh, 
um, because of unexpected expenses um, uh, that we had to pay um, to the state.
I said a couple of weeks ago, if I could afford to keep my child home and not send him to GHS, I would do it because I know what's happening out there. I know what's happening at Tanaka Hall. I know what's happening at Williams. I know what's happening at Meadowbrook. For the life of us, I cannot stand, I'm not going to say where, whether it's memorial or whatever, I'm not willing to do that. And I'm not willing to hear one of you say, I'm sorry. I have been too emotional about this whole thing because the families who need brick and mortar, I get it. But do they understand? Many of the letters say, I know there are risks. If you know there's a risk, don't lose it. Don't do it. But yes, there's a risk. We got a letter the other day saying when every time we drive in our cars, there's a risk. But this is so different because we are putting it upon our staff. We are putting it upon the children who really want to come back and be involved in athletics and music and art and all of the wonderful things that we can provide. But to delay for a while, if we can delay until the 31st, we ought to be able to say we can delay a little bit longer. It cannot be about the money, the money, the money. We have enough people in this community who will help us regain that money. I cannot sit here and agree with my colleagues for the reason of hospitalization and all of the ramifications, even if you survive this virus, you know the implications that will happen to people who have survived and come home. But you read all of that. We see it on our television. We hear it in our newspapers. I know we can do better. I have no money. I'm probably the broken person up here on this diet. I, I, I'm going on to today with this opportunity. Well, y'all didn't say that. You said you had more time. I, I, I'm done, Madam Chair. I said what I need to say. I'm not going along with it.
guess from the industry where I come from and where I work, I'm, my employees didn't expect me to do all these things. I can't have it. They didn't expect me to come out from That's what I'm saying. And they paid me to do anything I did outside of that because I'm uh, a little bit type A, was done on my own time. But the basis of what I needed to get to be prepared and just to operate a new software or something like that, it was still the training. So um, I, I just think that's why I'm taking the promotion with Dr. Eagle. But I think uh, Superintendent Clark, maybe if we have.
Schroeder to proceed with the full-time traditional brick-and-mortar option to begin August 31st with big planning the 24th to the 28th uh, as amended as described in the Alaska County Public School Florida Optional Innovative Reopening Plan as previously approved by the board. All in favor?